All right. Look at that. We're on. You and me, here together like this. It's a beautiful thing. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks podcast. My name is Jay Brown, and I am very grateful to you for hitting the play button today. Welcome if you're new. Everyone else, what's going on? Like on so many levels, not just like what's going on in your daily life, but like what's going on in the happenings of the universe. <laughs> Woo, I got to be honest. We're going to have to keep things a little bit tight in the intro this week. It is Sunday late afternoon. This has to go out tomorrow. I have been completely off of my usual routines over the last four or five days because my sister came into town to visit me. It's a very special occasion. I do not see my sister very often. It has been years since we've been together. I would say of all the people in my family, my sister is the person I am closest with. And it has been wonderful to spend time with her and talk with her. It has also brought up a lot of stuff <laughs> and so much stuff, y'all. Too much to really get into right now, frankly. One of the things it has brought up or one of the things that it triggered in me was I just completely fell off the sugar wagon like something horrible. <laughs> you know, it's I've been not completely off the wagon. I've been, you know, sort of under control with my sugar consumption. Longtime listeners know, have heard me talk about my sugar addiction here on the show before and leading up to my sister's visit. It wasn't like I was totally blowing it, but I was definitely like eating a few too many cookies, but it was okay. I was managing. I was working on the fence. I was doing all this like physical activity, which I did feel was kind of like a bit of a counter. However, <laughs> my sister got here and I just let it all go. And it climaxed yesterday when my cousin came to visit and brought these donuts. These fucking donuts. Oh my gosh. Woo, they were good, but I ate like maybe one or two too many yesterday. And I swore today, I said, I'm not eating any more sugary stuff. Like, I gotta stop. Like, I don't feel that great from it this morning. I can tell when I've gone too far. So I, I got off to a pretty good start. I, I ate some oats this morning for breakfast, for lunch. I did a little bit of leftover pasta with vegetables, mostly vegetables. And then I had some peaches because I wanted something sweet, you know. And the, we got these peaches at the farmer's market yesterday. And that was perfect. I should have just stopped right there. But I didn't stop right there. I, it's like I couldn't help myself. And I Grab that box. I ate one of those fucking donuts. <sighs> and you know, I don't feel that great right now. I feel a little tweaky and my stomach feels like heavy now. And it was like gratifying for like a minute while I was eating it. And now I really am thinking better of it. And mostly just because it was like I didn't have control. I didn't decide, I'm going to go ahead and eat some sugar right now. I didn't. I just... I just, you know, did that lizard brain thing and ate the donut. And <sighs> so that's it. I had to say that out loud just for myself here because I'm kind of jacked on sugar right now and feeling like I need to get on top of it again. You know, I got to get on top of it again. <laughs> right at a time when, oh man, things are looking tweaky all around. Like I was saying at the beginning, what's going on on many levels? Well, I don't know what's going on, y'all. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if any of you know what's going on, but I certainly don't. I have a sense of some internal things. I have a sense of when I've eaten too much sugar. But some of these bigger picture things we're facing with school starting again for my kids. I was saying this a little bit last week. I'm really not feeling like I have a lot of clarity. And I'm kind of betting I'm not the only one. So, for whatever it's worth, we're all just tumbling along here, it seems. Fortunately, we have a 
fantastic conversation to listen to today with my old friend, Carl Harwitz. And Carl and I go way, way back, as you will hear. And before there was a blog or a podcast for me, there were just people that I met who were interested in yoga study as much as I was, who I would have lengthy conversations like I do on this show, but even longer because we would just walk all around and talk. And one of those people who I would have those conversations with all those years ago was Carl. And we haven't spoken in over a decade. And then we recorded the first time we reunited. And it's wonderful when someone is the same person you remember them to be in wonderful, wonderful ways, you know? And I had such a good time reconnecting with Carl. He has a very interesting perspective and I think lots of insights to share. I'm really excited that you're going to get to hear our conversation today. Real quick before we get to it, though, I want to express some gratitude to our podcast premium subscribers, people like Marie Helene Guichard and Karina Clark. Thank you so much, Marie Helene and Karina. If you listen to the show and you want to have access to the full archives or you just want to show your support, becoming a podcast premium subscriber is the way to do that. It's a choose your rate that you can cancel at any time. And we understand that shit is rough right now. And if you don't have any money, then you can just email us and we will give you a free account. But if you do have a little something that you can contribute, it is making a huge difference. And we are very, very grateful. You can learn about becoming a podcast premium subscriber and all of my other stuff, all of my ongoing live stream classes and the weekly teacher's call I do and all the other things I offer. Everything I'm doing can be found at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, y'all, like I said, we're late afternoon on Sunday. The family, my sister and my wife and kids, like they went out for like a couple of hours just so like I could get a little bit of this done. (laughs) So we are going to just leave it here. I will touch base with you on the other side briefly. But for now, let's go ahead and listen to this conversation that I had with my old friend, Carl Harwitz. Hello. Hey. I am here again. Here we are. Cool. We're going to go with this. We're going to go with this. It's funny to me that, you know, you, we have, we're all using these Bluetooth headphones now. I actually try to use wired stuff as much as I can because... I don't know, man. I'm I'm getting old. We're old, Carl. We're old and we got kids and they like TikTok and we don't and stuff. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) You know, the only reason I like Bluetooth is because I don't listen to stuff with quality sound, like when I'm using headphones. Yeah. And um, it's just such a pain in the ass to plug in and unplug and plug in and unplug. So they just... Um, there are headphones and, and I don't have to worry about wire connecting to cell phone or anything like that for, for, I hear you and all the teachers teaching online, you're using them so they can teach their online classes. So, you know, I, I definitely don't use headphones for teaching online. Oh, all right. All right. Well, I, I just, I just look at the screen and say, How's your neck feel? That looks like your neck's a little tense. Try looking somewhere else. (laughs) (laughs) Why do you think you're supposed to look at your hand? Look to the side instead. Does that feel better? Carl, it's like no time has passed, my friend, but it's got to be, I don't even know how long it's been since I've spoken to you. Well, I've got it like... Uh, 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 a gauge of time. How old was my daughter? Two? Maybe. Three? Maybe, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, my, yeah. My, my kid is 19. Oh my gosh. 
See, I was thinking it could be as long as 15 years, and you're saying 17 years. Wow. 15, 16, 17. It's somewhere in there. It's it's, that's a ballpark. Time. And, you know, at a certain point, I just, I buried my head in the sand and decided I didn't really want anything, like in terms of professional stuff, I didn't want anything in between um, – me and reading what's going on with the students I'm working with. So um, I, I don't pay attention to anything in the yoga world. It's interesting you say that, Carl, because there's so many layers to this moment for me, especially because what prompted it is me hearing that you're teaching some classes at Crunch Gym again. Right. And I flash back to whatever it was maybe when. even more than 17 years ago because when we were talking to each other it was yeah. us talk we were at we we're at the breathing project well, I that's believe. about 20 okay breathing project was probably 18 years ago yeah okay so it was breathing project and i was teaching in all these different centers and we were talking about like centers putting pressure on teachers to teach in certain ways and that's why we had a class at the breathing project because we had freedom to teach what we really felt we wanted to teach and what yeah. we were teaching was very unconventional and you had a class or two i don't know how many or something at crunch gym which there's a long tradition in new york city for you know sharon and david right. from jiva mukti taught at crunch uh cindy lee from ohm taught at crunch you know there's a kind of a yeah. long history of teachers teaching at crunch and you were always teaching there. And I remember kind of, I don't know, not giving you shit about it, but being like, why wow, you like teaching at the gym and you kind of making a very impassioned case for why you like teaching there better than yoga centers. Yeah. And I, at the time didn't get it, but now in retrospect, I totally do is what I want to say. <laughs> and you know what? I don't teach at any yoga centers right now. I teach privately or I teach for crunch gyms. And one of the things I like about crunch, I don't know about other gyms. I have to be honest, but one of the things I like about crunch is I come, I show up, I teach my class. People like me, they leave me alone. As long as I come and teach my class and the people go, I like Carl. Um, and you know, I don't know that there's any formula for the I like so-and-so part because I see a lot of stuff that I look at and I'm like, oh my God, this teacher is teaching that. Are they looking at the... And sometimes you're looking at a class, like a group class, and I, I, I really close my eyes these days, but um, you know, you're looking at a class and it's almost like someone is teaching like treadmill running to a group full of people in wheelchairs and you're like why are you teaching that what what is the purpose of you running a class where everyone's sitting watching you because no one can do what you you ask them to i don't i don't personally get it but i also get that what different people like is what different people like and from my perspective in my room my priorities are Number one, safe. Number two, it should be fun. I don't care how I get people to have fun. Sometimes it's just like really dumb jokes <laughs> while they're doing something that's like, ah, this is kind of work. Um, and, you know, safe, fun, maybe it's effective. Maybe it's useful, right? The, the issue, in my opinion, is what you don't want is dangerous, right? Which is where, where we started is I, I look at whether it's in a group class, like online or in person, I look at like patterns of tension in people's bodies. And I'm like, what's going on with your lower back? That looks really tense. And I mean, I don't say it exactly that way, but you know, it's interesting how often people are like, no, I feel fine. And I'm like, see what happens if you bend your knees a little. And they go, oh, wow, that feels much better. My back now feels good. It's like, yeah, well. <laughs> well, the little bend of the knees was a sacrilege that you and I embraced a long time ago. Exactly. I guess, well, I would say, 
I don't know. There's a lot to, to what you just said. I think part of it is that I remember you. And when we were having that conversation at the breathing project about the pressure to teach a certain way, it was essentially when like vinyasa yoga took over or something and it became like this more fitness oriented thing. And then everybody incorporated all kinds of stuff into that. Um, And you were somebody who was like holding a line back then. And I kind of want to go back there though. I want to, I don't really, I don't really remember first of all, when we first met, cause I know it was before breathing project. I do yeah. remember you were like, we, we met at a Mark workshop. Okay. 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 Like, okay. and we kind of clicked and then I showed up to your class when you were teaching, um, at something that, uh, Allison West was calling yoga union that yes. was in Soho. Yes. Um, wow. long before she opened, uh, uh, an actual studio where. Okay. Okay. I remember now, now I had Allison on, we talked about that time. So that's when you, we first met. Okay. I remember now. And I have a memory of you being like a skateboarder. Weren't you like a professional skateboarder or something? Yeah. I was in the circus. I, it, it was inline skates, but I skateboard also. And I wrote oh, okay. like what I was professional with was inline skates. Uh, some people call them rollerblades. You did like crazy half pipe gymnastic flip shit, right? Yeah. Well, there was one time I was in like a Leslie Kamenoff class. This is just comedy in my opinion. And he had us in a reclining twist and I extended one leg and grabbed the outside edge of my foot. And I bent the other knee and grabbed that foot so that I'm in a twist that's a little more fancy. It's something I'd never do now because it would be for my body beside the point. I would not get as much as something simpler. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the time I thought this is cool. Yeah. You were showing Um, off. (laughs) I was, and, and <laughs> Leslie, Leslie walked by and he was like, I invented that pose. And I laughed at him and I said, we used to do this 25 feet up in the air on skateboard ramps. How could you have invented it? The body just does things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, but I remember you had like a sense of your body in space, like in inversions yeah. or whatever it was. And that's because of this time on half pipes on, on inline skates, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm still like, I have some interesting information for when someone's close and like interested in learning how to balance upside down that, that throws on its head everything that everyone else like teaches about handstands. It's like tighten your abs spread your fingers and press your hands into the ground. Absolutely not. Have your fingers a little bent, have your hands really soft. Don't even think about contracting your abdomen. It will contract how it's supposed to when you're balancing upside down. Play with finding your hips centering over your shoulders, over your hands. Don't even worry about what form looks like. Once you can balance, you will be able to play with your posture as much as you like, whether it's like, you know, in, in, in the circus, the, the Russians, when they did handstands were very like ballet rigid, it must be perfect. And the Hungarians were sort of like more laid back. Hey, it can be a little bit relaxed instead. And when you have control over the balance, you can have whatever posture upside down, including you can slump, right? We can stand and balance and, and, and like lean off to the side and hunch our back and stay balanced. You can do that upside down if your balance is really solid. Um, so you probably need a certain part, amount of strength to support that too. But also that you just- would take, that would actually take more strength than having good, good with quotes around it, good form. Um, but well, you mentioned Leslie circus, admit, didn't you? Did you spend time doing circus stuff too? Is that, do I have a memory of that also? You know, the only thing I did in the circus was skate. Um, okay. Oh, oh, there I see, were I see. guys, there were guys 
you know, stayed on the ramps that we had for the circus. There were guys, there was one guy who was part of um, our group who by the end of the tour was in the high wire act and not uh, in our group anymore. Hmm. Um, there were guys who like tried trapeze, tried a bunch of other things, but, but me, I was like, man, I'm into skating. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why we hit it off. Cause I, I was never like a full blown skater, but I certainly spent a little time when I grew up in Los Angeles on a skateboard and a little time on half pipes. Although I got scared at a certain point and, and I, and I lost my nerve, but, uh, I think we hit it off because you had that vibe. You had that, like you said at the very beginning, you, it has to be fun. And you had that like kind of skater irreverence, let's have fun and explore yeah. vibe. Right. And I, I mean, I think the explore, I definitely, the way I skated was, you know, it, and you know, part of why I was a pro skater, right? I wasn't the best skater. I was an okay skater. Like I did get sponsored. I had like companies send me to um, competitions before I got hired to go to the circus. Um, a lot of the times in state competitions, what would happen is like there were kids who were younger than me, who were definitely way better than me, who would place lower than me in the competitions because they'd come out and they just have learned a brand new trick that's like, this is the best one. It's going to make me win the competition. And they try it and fall and then the run is over. Mm -hmm. And I went out and I just did cool lines and did what I liked. And maybe I threw a big trick at the end, like, will I land it or not? Who cares? Mm -hmm. um, but most of it was lines and the stuff that I was doing, I could you know, like a 360 is not a big deal. And, you know, making it so that you're carving the ramp while doing um, your airs, the judges like stuff like that. So none of it was like really high technical, but I got high marks for like artistic uh, presentation and, and creativity rather than for like technical skill. Um, substance, but I substance rather than flash. You could say it that way. Yeah, there you go. Well, because I, I think there's a par there's a parallel. Like when we right. met each other in yoga, we were both not interested. I, I had already like gone through the ringer of asana showmanship and was like, let's let's get to something better and more interesting than that. Right, and and you know find more useful goals for people in practice than like, can I get my foot behind my head? How far into a split can I go? Does it matter? Will this actually help you reach up for that? Like can on the top shelf in your, in your cupboard. Um, and, and I mean, you know, when, when you have people who haven't assessed what their goals and practice are, and then you start making them think about that. Like, why do you think you have to have your knees locked and your legs straight and get your chest as close to your thighs and the forward bend as you can? What will that do for you? Uh, it, if your knees are a little bent, now all of a sudden this is about the health of your lower back and you'll still stretch your hamstrings and they will still work better for you, but you won't torture them. See, that's what I remember about you. You didn't ever shy away from being a bit confrontational with a, someone who came to your class about what they were doing or like it, it again, it, at a certain point, things just shifted and it was much more about meeting people where they were, you know, rather yeah. than, than like holding their feet to some fire. I do think I'm less confrontational now than I was then. I definitely <laughs> yes, was like, we were young and punky, Carl. I, we were I young was and punky. <laughs> edgy. <laughs> definitely was. I, uh, guilty as charged. But, um, you know, these days when someone's like insistent on like, I can look, I can see that's just not fitting you. Um, but they're really, I want to do this. It's like, all right. That's okay. I'm good with that. And I also realized that with stuff like that, 
when someone starts to know you know what you're looking at and trusts you, you can have a bigger impact on how they make decisions than if they don't really know you well or trust you yet. Of course. That, that, of course. That, um, the, the first part is establishing the relationship and, and getting people to realize that um, what you're doing with your eyes as you're seeing them is actually trying to help them rather than something else. Right. Well, I guess I'm, I'm wondering to go back some, cause yeah. you know, we, we we're, we're referring back to a time that maybe is no longer. <laughs> yeah. we, we knew each other in this glory time in New York and the people who listen to this show are probably like tired of hearing me go on and on and be so waxing poetic about how amazing it was at this one time in New York. But anybody who was there knows that it was a pretty thriving time. I remember there was a like yoga scene. Yeah. And it was vibrant. And I remember, do I have a a clear memory of you? Was it New York yoga and doing teacher training there? I did. um, Maybe just taught classes. No, no, no. I, I, I taught there at some point they pulled me in to teach small parts of teacher teacher training Okay, right. And then at some part point, they had me run their teacher training. Right. Um, and I made it clear to them that while that was happening, I was also teaching um, big parts of a teacher training at another center called Yoga Sutra. Mm. And, um, Whose place was uh, that? I forgot. Oh God, that's a complicated. Hildebrand question. is it? Dave Hildebrand? What, who's who's the one who opened the? David Sutra? Hildebrand is who brought me in. Um, Chris, my goodness, I can't remember his last name, but okay. he was a great crazy character. He was like Mister Mysore Stanga. Chris, um, I would it, have to look up. My it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the <laughs> name. Okay, but I remember. I remember there was that other center that you also taught at. So David, David Hollander, Christopher Hildebrand. But that's interesting because you you established that boundary. You're like, yeah, I'll do this for you, but I'm also teaching in other places. There was like no people making you sign no compete clauses or whatever. Right, and you know, I only did it for a short time, and at a certain point, there was one time where like. This woman was asking me in the teacher training at New York Yoga, um, which direction is my knee supposed to point in Warrior Two? And I sort of showed her the mechanics of knees, <laughs> and and that if your foot and your knee are tracking in line with each other, it's good, and. If your knee is pointing in one direction and your foot is twisting in another direction, that's not good for your knee to twist your knee. And that the priority was that your knee was safe. And and so what you didn't want is something in the position that would torque your knee. Like if you're trying to have your foot and knee point straight forward and you're turning your hips too far out in warrior two, your Mm -hmm. knee's going to start drifting inward. Mm-hmm. And if your knee starts drifting inward, either you have to change the angle of your foot or you have to change the angle of your hips so your hips aren't pulling your knee in. Mm. I don't care which one it is as long as your knee is safe. In the end. Well, I don't know, because it could be like someone has a, a shaped femur or whatever and it goes in a little. Like some people could go in a little bit, right? It doesn't have to be... Like, isn't there a let's, certain amount of lust, like that kind of variation to human bodies where not everybody's we, knee is going to track exactly? We might be talking about different things. Yeah. Um, that I can have, I'm taking Warrior 2 now. I'm actually standing. Right? <laughs> I'm in it. Warrior 2. I, 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 <laughs> I um, love you, Kyle. You haven't changed a bit, man. I love it. Okay, so you're exactly. in room two. Keep going. So, so now I'm turning my foot in a little and my knee is turning in with my foot. But there is no torque on my knee because right. they're tracking well with each other. Right. Right? 
But that's They're your body. Could, I'm talking about somebody else's body, not your body. Correct. Now, I was going to go there. There was one time um, I walked up to this woman in a group class of mine, and one of her put, feet was pointing st- forward, and her other foot, she's just standing both feet on the floor six inches apart with those directions of with quotes around it, your feet parallel to each other. And the other mm. foot is pointing out. And I walked up and I looked and I was like, anything going on here? And she was like, yeah, have a look, have a closer look. And I looked, her knee was tracking perfectly in line with her shin, her foot, that second foot was just put on a little um, differently than most people's were. That was still her standing with like knees and feet tracking in line with each other. What I'm talking about by tracking in line with each other is if you put your foot in a position that causes your shin to twist, to twist your knee, that is not your foot and knee tracking in line with each other. But if you put your foot in a position where you can bend and straighten your knee comfortably without there being twist on your knee from the leverage of your foot pressing into the ground, turning your um, uh, lower leg, um, that would be not your your foot tracking in line with your knee. Um, So it doesn't doesn't mean they point in the same direction. It just means that your foot placement is not causing your knee to be twisted. I know. And see, that is a bit of, see, isn't that in reaction to like whatever certain alignment instructions that were rampant in the yoga world? Like yeah. That told us to do certain things with our bodies that even back then you were really questioning as was I. Actually, I've got two funny stories and they're totally related to this in my opinion. Go ahead. This, um, my wife was a dancer. You, you met my wife. Mm. She taught me a lot about movement. And, you know, uh, early in our, like, dating, she was like, you know, look, go study with this guy um, who was a movement specialist who had taught at um, NYU. His name was Andre Bernard. And I did. A- and part of the reason why is what I'm about to say. I showed her video footage of like a bunch of skaters, skateboarders and inline skaters. um, And we're watching footage and I was like, this is stuff I love. And she was like, oh no, he's no good. No, he's no good. No, he's no good. And then one guy comes on and she's like, oh, he's good. He actually moves well. And that was Tony Hawk. (laughs) Totally funny. She had no idea who any of these guys were. Steve Caballero, no, he's too stiff. I swear to God. So I open up a light on yoga for my wife. And I'm like, you have to look at, and she's like, oh no, I can't look at that book. That man looks like he's unhappy in all of those poses. And he, he well, apparently he like was in the he, hospital for days after they took all those photos. Yeah. He, she said he <laughs> looks like he's in pain in most of those photos. And I realized after she said, I had never considered it before that, but I looked and I was like, she's right. He really does not look like a happy person. And so many of those extreme poses, like he looks like he's forcing himself into it rather than uh, it being organic. Mm. And I think, especially back then, I don't really know what's out there today. But I think there's a lot more. I made a joke about this earlier, but we were both talking. There's a lot of this um, dance choreography fitness yoga out there these days that, that is passing itself off as vinyasa, where it's like, inhale this pose, exhale this pose, inhale this pose, exhale this pose. And, and the poses don't go together at all, but they link coolly to each other, and you're never holding a pose. And You know, my memory of how standing poses are supposed to be done is you're supposed to hold them for a few breaths, like traditionally something like five breaths. Well, let me let me ask you about that then. Okay, so what would you say? I know that you had a lot of different people that you studied with, as I did. What do you Mm -hmm. think of as your 
your biggest influences when it comes to yoga? Like, what are you, are, are you a, a desk, a chart? Would you identify that way? I mean, that's the thing that I have to identify with is my, the one that I, I'm close, most closely aligned with would have to be the teachings that he gave people. What would you say about what you do? Where would you point it back to? I, I think we can go towards Desik Kachar. Philosophically, um, uh, I think I got a lot and, and learned a lot from Desik Kachar. And I, I remember there was this um, interview that someone did where they came up with a whole bunch of questions and they asked the questions to um, Desik Kachar, Krishnamachar, uh, not Krishna, Desik Kachar, Iyengar, and Patabi Joyce. Um, and you got to see side by side all their answers um, for these questions. And I thought that was extremely fascinating. And, and the one that I thought was the most, you know, influential to me, um, uh, I think the question was, what is yoga for? What are, what are you supposed to get out of yoga? Um, what what are the goals of yoga? It was something along those lines, and both Patabi Joyce and and Iyengar um, said something about God. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that question as long as you're dealing with someone who believes in God. But Desi Char's answer, I thought, was um, pretty holistic. It was um, it really depends on the person practicing, doesn't it? Um, and so from that standpoint, I feel like I'm aligned with that idea. But I remember when Desiachar had Kalstub send out, and this is where I walked away from everything. When Desiachar had Kalstub send out um, an email to everyone who had studied under him and um, people who were thinking of using the term Vini Yoga or whatever, like it, it, I got the email. I'm pretty sure you got the email. Yeah, yeah, I got um, it. And it basically was like, if you want to use the term Vinny Yoga, you can't use my name. If you want to use my name, you shouldn't use the term Vinny Yoga. And that made me walk away and realize I just don't want anything in between me and the people I'm working with. I want to be able to read what's going on with them converse with them and make judgments to help them make better decisions for themselves. But I don't want some uh, lineage or some with quotes around it, higher power from outside of me <laughs> the, the, having dictates on my practice. So there are times I work with people where it looks a lot like Dasikachar Yoga. And there are other times I work with people and it looks like any old vinyasa class, but it might go a little bit slower. Well, you know, it's so amazing to me that you brought up that video of the interviews of them because I saw that too and it had a huge impact on me as well. And I remember, I think it was, I don't know if we're talking about the same question, but they definitely, I definitely remember them asking about like, like what's the purpose of yoga? And they were very like, yeah know your true self or your divine yeah. purpose, divine self and all this yeah. stuff. And then Desika Chars, what I remember him saying is something about, oh, you do a little something or you do some practice. And then what was bothering you is not bothering you as much or something like that. It was just like really practical, like you were saying. Yeah. And I, I said, might be different. Um, this interviews. Like yeah. Thesis. This was like a, a thesis for someone's college, grad school, something or other. And huh. it was like presented in a magazine in written form oh, um, wow. in several parts. Um, okay. And okay. for that, his, his response was, it really depends on the person practicing, doesn't it? Like he, he yeah. framed it as a question. But I, I still agree with that also that, you know, I'm, I'm, totally confident in group classes saying, you know, the way I think about this is kind of like dental floss for all your joints. And I can show people within like the first 15 minutes of practice, we have moved the spine forward, bend, back, bend, side lean, twist, and the arms and legs, the hip and shoulder joints have moved in pretty much every direction they can move within 15 minutes as well. 
Good to go. Um, <laughs> well, you know, what's yeah. interesting to me, though, you point to that, that email. It was early on in email, but I got it too. And I talked with Gary when Gary came on the show about that moment too. Mm -hmm. And it was like an early hallmark of like a division that ended up becoming a huge schism and break, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and you, you felt that early on. I remember that email was such a thing. And because I had been sort of using the term and then stopped because uh, yeah and by the way i love the way gary taught um, yeah and one of the things that irked me about it was the message was political yeah yeah and deskachar had told gary you can use this term and had approved everything right. in those books that he made that had the title um, Vinny Yoga. So it sort of was like, I take away your branding license. Um, yeah, there's like, you know, like Paul Harvey also is the same. He's been, he used that term because Desika Char had sort of told people to use the term in, at some point. But then right. when that whole thing happened, he was just going along with Kalstub, I guess, at the time. Yeah. People sort of knew this that. This was my read on it. I don't really know. I don't really care. By the way, I could, I could say, um, you know, I, I think, I think someone like Gary is very smart and very like brilliant, um, able to be precise. But I also think if you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J Brown yoga talks to hear the rest of our conversation. Please subscribe to podcast premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.